Hello, dear friends. This is the third article I talked about alchemy. Third times the charm. I try to make it as simple as possible, so that it is understood as far as possible. So, today I sacrifice topicality in the name of eternal and imperishable wisdom. Opinion piece. Escape from the matrix. The key is detachment. The matrix is called samsara. Liberation is called nirvana. The escape from Atlanta is an allegory. It has a great fantastic symbolic charge. It is the most beautiful and suggestive book of all times. Letter of Aristeo to his son about the Amectic Magisterium. The path to the self to knowledge resembles the madman of the tarot. An alteration of reality opens the door to see beyond. It is good to have good dreams, but it is better to wake up from the dream. It is good to be in solidarity, but we cannot help if we are victims. The Christic act of compassion coincides with the Bodhisattva Oath. Sovereignty resides in the people, from whom all the powers of the state emanate. R rulers are tempted to feel sovereign like the kings of gold, of old, of ancient times, I mean. Let's start. Fed up with be being in prison, confined by the matrix, so am I. Ready to take the red pill, me too. You can't escape the matrix unless you know it isn't it. In essence, the matrix is this space-time continuum. This is the reality of a space and time that we are trapped in. When we are identified with our mind and think, we are a body and are lost in the illusion of time. By connecting dot, the dots between major or among major world events, it gives us a clearer context to better understand the simulated reality we have been living in. Buddha said that the key to everything is detachment and the extinction of desire. It is to say, changing the software of the human being, but alchemists seek the transformation of the hardware. It is to say, raising the frequency in the matter of the human body. Both paths are complementary and are not, not mutually exclusive, because, because their goal is the same, liberation or spiritual enlightenment. Philip K. Dick said in a lecture in 1977, in quotes, We live in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have is when a variable is changed and alteration occurs in our reality. Right now, we are living throughout an alteration of our reality called a health crisis, and therefore, it is an opportunity to see beyond the looking glass or the mirror. The matrix of Buddhism is called samsara and has produced the great metaphor of our time to refer to an age-old sensation, the suspicion that the world we experience conventionally is an illusion, a delusion. The Christic act is an act of pure compassion to sacrifice one's life to save others. It coincides with the Bodhisattva's oath to dedicate countless lives to liberate all beings, to remain within samsara until all beings attain liberation, according to Alejandro Martinez Gallardo. If we get too involved in this nightmare, it is possible that we will be more trapped in it, 
but if we try to have good dreams, it is possible that we will save ourselves a lot of suffering. But the best thing is not to have good dreams, but to wake up from the dream. And all the deception will automatically dissolve. This doesn't mean that we should not be in solidarity with our brothers and that each one should fulfill his mission in life, but without letting ourselves be trapped in the nightmare, because if we become victims, we cannot help anyone. I am not referring at all when I talked about getting out of the matrix to a life on the margins of society. On the contrary, it is the more one can help society, the more one is able to mark a different path. Definition We have all lived in the matrix all our lives, but few can actually see it, let alone understand what is or how to escape from this phantasmagoric matrix. The matrix represents the entire wealth system of deception involving government, religion, commerce and culture that ignorant humans have created under the control of the wicked one, the god of this world. The matrix is primarily spiritual in nature, but includes physical, political and economic power structures and systems of enslavement or control. This fallen wealth system represents the kingdom of the lawless one, along with all the kingdoms of this world throughout history. In 1999, the movie The Matrix was not just a science fiction movie about a time far in the future where machines ruled the planet and subjected people to total mind control by artificial intelligence by creating a virtual reality world for them to live in. Humans were disconnected from the real world all the time, being completely enslaved and used as a power source to keep the machines running. No, the matrix was a kind of modern parable and the description of our current state and as slaves. The globalist elite use propaganda sources like Hollywood to cryptically show their plans for enslavement to the dumped down masses and hide it in plain sight as if it were mere entertainment. This ensures that they have given sufficient warning and that the ship will willingly consent to their enslavement by acquiescence th thought few though few will really understand corporate governments believe that they, that we the people are nothing more than chattel and that everything we own is their property the intention of the globalists is to ultimately implement a totalitarian world government of their old world order, where all nation states and all natural human rights are abolished. They plan to disarm us and tattoo us with digital identification like cattle, it is to say with the mark of the beast, while enacting a totalitarian surveillance state. Their plan is to destroy our faith, our freedom, our family, our identity, our culture, our nation, our work and business, our health and even our lives, and confiscate all our private property, including our children. This would only apply to those who survive their plan to reduce the world's population according to the Georgia Guidestones. Popular Sovereignty Everyone forgest, forgets the first article of the Spanish Constitution, which says that national sovereignty resides in the Spanish people. 
from whom the powers of the state em emanate. And Article 10 says that the dignity of the person and his rights, according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are the basis of social peace. The English philosopher Thomas Hobbes, the Leviathan, 1651, points out that there is a civil law written in code and the natural law unwritten, which is part of the human tradition and which contains values that must be respected. The Swiss thinker Jean Jacques Rousseau, the social contract, 1762, points out that the real and original sovereign is the collectivity, which gives power to a ruler. The French Revolution, 1789, establishes in the constitution born from it that sovereignty comes from the people and rests on them. Since then, this has been an essential principle of democracy. Often, rulers fall into the temptation of feeling sovereign, like the kings and monarchs of other times, or simply like the autocrats and despots that proliferate in our days. There is no doubt about it. Any regime that doesn't respect this sacred democratic principle is at the opposite pole of democracy and sets up its store in the field of the dictatorship, according to Professor Gustavo Luis Carrera. The flight of Atalanta. Atalanta Fusions has been considered the most beautiful and suggested emblem book of all times. Its author, Michael Meyer, um, 1568-1622, was a celebrated alchemist and a court physician to Emperor Rudolf II of Prague between 1614 and 1622. Meyer conceived a series of illustrated alchemical works, among which the Fug of Atalanta is undoubtedly the most important. First published in Oppenheim in 1617, it is part of the Rosicrucian spiritual movement that flourished during the first decades of the 17th century in the German principalities to which both of the book's editor, Theodore de, Bri de Bray, and the author of, of its engravings, Marian, belonged. Part of the fascination aroused by this book is due to its triple nature, as a visual emblem book and a musical work with 50 scores accompanying the images, and a purely textual volume with its epigrams and alchemical commentaries. For all these reasons, Atalanta Fusions can be considered the first multimedia book in European cultural history. Greek mythology. What this represented in Atalanta Fusions is inspired by Greek mythology, especially by the work of the Roman poet Ovid, the Metamorphosis. Surely, those who have read this text and those who watched Her Hercules remember the legendary Yarnis and the beautiful and athletic Atalanta, eternal muse of Hippomenes. Legend has it that Atalanta would only marry the one who defeated her in a race, but no one could. So, the enamored Hippomenes made a pact with Aphrodite to distract Atalanta with three the golden apples from the garden of the Spiritus. Aphrodite does so, and Atalanta, in the middle of the race, picks up the apples, and that is how Hippomenes wins the race and the hand of his beloved nymph. Thus we recognize this story in the 50 engravings accompanied by a motto, poem, or epigram 
representing the journey from being to knowledge, similar to the path of the fool in the Tarot. According to Jocelyn Godwit, just as Atalanta flees, so one voice suddenly escapes and is followed by another, Hippomenes. As the third voice enters, the others stabilize are held in place. The three voices presenting each escape represent the three alchemical principles, mercury, sulfur and salt, which represent the spirit, soul and body respectively. We can also recognize this analogy in the three states in life of the human being according to Meyer. In quotes, the human being is a compendium of the universe by the manner of which he is composed and is destined to live three kinds of life, viz. the vegetative life in the maternal womb, where grows and increases in the manner of a plant, the sensible life which he leads in this world, where he is led above all by his senses. Like the other animals from which he differs, in that he begins to avail himself of his intelligence, thought in an imperfect way, and finally the intelligible life in the other world near God and the intelligence that assists him or good angles. However, the true message of these engravings and epigrams is far from being fully revealed, and the symbolic load they possess is fantastic. Letter of Aristeo Letter of Aristeus to his son on the Emetic Magisterium, extracted from the Library of the Emetic Philosophers, manuscript of the Library of Grenoble, number 819. 18th century, pages 1083-1092, transcribed by José Luis Rodríguez Guerrero. Let's start. My son, after having transmitted to you the knowledge of all things, and having taught you how you should live and regulate your conduct according to the maxims of an excellent philosophy, after having instructed you on everything that concerns the order and knowledge of the monarchy of the universe, it only remains for me to give you the keys of nature, preserved by me with great care. All of these keys, the one which opens the locked place, occupies without difficulty the highest rank. It is the very source of all things and there can be no doubt that God has given it an altogether divine property. To him who is in possession of this key, riches become contentable, no treasure can compare with it. Of what use are riches to those who are subject to the misfortunes inflicted by human infirmities, what in, in interrogations? What are treasures worth when one is struck down by death? There are no riches to be preserved when death seizes us. But if I possess the key, I shall keep my death as far away as possible, and moreover, I shall be sure to have acquired a great secret which will ward off all sorts of sufferings. Riches are in my hand. I do not lack treasures. Langer flees. Death tarries when I have the golden key. Now, my son, I am going to give you it to give it to you as an inheritance, but I conjure you by the name of God and by his holy throne to keep it locked in the chest of your heart and subject it to the seal of silence. If you make use of it, it will find you with good things, and when you are old or begin to see your body decline, it will relieve you, renew you, 
and angel you. For it happens that by a you peculiar, peculiar to it, it remedies all diseases, ennobles metals, and makes its possessor happy. Our fathers asked us under oath to learn to know it and not fail to use it to do good to the indigent, the orphan, and the needy, making this behavior our mark and our genuine character. All things under heaven, divided into different species, have as their origin one and the same principle, and this is the air from which everything flows. The food of each thing shows what is what its origin is, since that which sustains life is also that which sustains being. The fish uses the water, the child suckles from its mother. By its life we know the principle of these things. The life of these things is air. This is therefore the principle of things. Moreover, air corrupts the body of all things. That which brings life as a gift can also interrupt life. Wood, iron, stones are dissolved by fire, and by it all things return to their primordial state. Here is the cause of generation, which is also by different methods of corruption. And if it happens that certain creatures suffer either by the effect of time or by a fortuitous event, the air suddenly comes to the, their aid to cure them of their imperfection and their disease. The earth, the tree, the grass languish sometimes by excess of heat. The dew of the air repairs in all of them this defect. Thus no creature can be restored except by something of its own nature. And it happens that air is the fundamental principle of all these things, so that it may be concluded that it is the only universal medicine. We know that in it itself is found the seed, life, death, disease, the remedy par excellence. In it nature has enclosed, enclosed all its treasures and has compressed them as in a particular deposit of its own. However, to have the golden keys is to know how to free this watertight chamber to extract the air from the air. But if one ignores how to trap that air, then it is impossible to acquire that which cures particular and general diseases, calling metals to life. If you wish to expel all diseases, it is necessary that you seek the remedy within the common source. Nature produces the like by taking it out of the like, and reunite species with species. Learn then, my son, to capture the air learn to keep the golden key of nature. All creatures can perfectly catch the air if they know the key of nature, only if they know this key. To know how to extract the air from the celestial arcanum is truly a secret beyond the capacity of the human spirit, a great secret that contains the virtue that nature has attributed to all things. For species are caught by means of their similar species. A fish is caught by a fish, a bed by another bed, and the air is caught by another air that seduces it. Snow and ice are air that the cold has frozen. Nature has given them a disposition that allows them to be able to capture the air. Place one of these two things in a closed glass. Get hold of the air that freezes around, collecting what is what is distilled in the form of warm 
moist moisture in a small deep closed thick strong and clean vessel so that you can do as much as you please either the rays of the sun or the moon when the glass is full close its mouth tightly so that this celestial spark which is there concentrated does not dissipate in the air fill as many glasses as you wish with this liquid then attend to what you must do and keep silent build a small furnace furnace adapted to it a glass half full of that captured air seal it then arrange the fire in such a way that only the lightest portion of the smoke rises without violence as it does in nature in the center of the earth where the fire hits without ceasing producing a continuous circulation of the vapors of the air let this fire be moderate humid soft similar to that of a bird incubating its eggs when this disposition is achieved you must continue in such a way that the aerial fruit cooks without being consumed, stirring it from, for a long time until it is entirely cooked at the bottom of the glass. Add new air to this air, not in great quantity, but in the proportion what it is, that it is necessary. Make it make in such a way that it liquefies slight, slightly, that it rots, that it blankens, that it coagulates and that once fixed it reddens. Then take the pure part separated from the impure part by means of fire and a divine artifice. Take at last the pure part of a raw air to which you will unite again the pure hardened part. Do it in such a way that they dissolve, that they unite, that they blanken slightly that they become white, that they harden, and that finally they redden. Here the work ends. You have made the elixir that produces all the wonders you have seen. You have the golden key, the portable gold, the medicine of all things, an inexhaustible treasure. So be it. Amen. Thanks a lot, dear friends.